My name is Brianna, and I welcome you to the Tales of Adventure, a D&D podcast like no other. Hey guys, Brianna here with a quick message for all of you lovely members of the TTRPG community. We have a group of friends who needs your help. Go on Twitter and check out Homebrew Queens at, at Homebrew Queens and see what you can do to help these lovely ladies bring their father back to the table. Let's show them what community is all about. My character is Lumby Bronzearm. She is a halfling brawler paladin multiclass in the Pathfinder First Edition setting. She was a character that I played from first through eighth level in the Curse of the Crimson Throne adventure path over the course of two real life years. You look rather bored sitting here by yourself. Mind if I join you? Oh, not at all. It's always nice to see a fresh face around Corvosa these days. Yes, I'm definitely rather new here, but I like it. It's a, it has a charm to it. Well, you should have seen it several years ago. It's a, it's a lot nicer now since the Queen's been gone. Yes, I remember hearing about that. Where do you hear when that happened? Oh, goodness, yes. You clearly must be new to town because you see this here on my, on my jacket, this little pin? The the large key I wear? Yes. This is the symbol of the gardeners and the symbol of Abadar. Uh, my, my name is Lumby, Lumby Bronzearm. Uh, I'm a, a paladin of the Church of Abadar here in Corvosa. Uh, I'm also a member of the gardeners. We were the group that actually helped take down the queen uh, after the blood plague. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. My name is Estran. It's so nice to meet you, Estran. How did you get involved with the gardeners, and how did you become a paladin? And just, huh. I, I'm curious to hear your story. Well, that's that takes me way back. The first time I met the gardeners, I was just living with Joe Fiel, my gnome friend. She she's an, a traveling alchemist, you see, and we had been traveling from city to city. When both of us had received the strangest thing, I had thought, woken up with a small tarot card underneath my pillow and along with a note telling me that if I wanted to see Gadrin Lamb brought to justice to meet at a, a certain fortune teller's house. Now, I, I, I don't love t- talking about this, but my mother, Fudo, was a, a prostitute at Gadrin Lamb's brothel, the, the shepherd's ranch, back when I was a child. But he always chased me, even after I had escaped when I was 12. Sounds like a bastard. He was a bastard. He never even called me by my name. He always called me his future prophets. That's disgusting. Yeah, he was he, he wasn't a pleasant man, but I didn't know that at the time Joe Fiel, like I said, she's an alchemist. She used to make shiver for him as well, uh, which was a very addictive chemical, and she owed him a lot of money. So we knew that both of us would greatly benefit from anything that could take him out. So we went and met up with the mystic, and that was where we met up with Ketu. He was a giant Shawanti man. Uh, he was a shaman. An incredible forces that he, he seemed to call down from the stars. Aiden still speak. He was a half-elf. Used a bow. He loved orphans. Even though he would never have admitted it, he was he had a heart of gold, that one. I've met people like that. They're much better than they will ever admit. Absolutely. He, he wanted everyone to think he was just the worst kind of thief and scoundrel, but I, I saw how much gold he, he funneled into the orphanages here in town. And then there was Laura Lissa. She was the the bookish one. I don't remember why what she had against Gadrin Lamb, but all of us had some connection to him at the at that point. And so we managed to find him deep beneath the, the sewers of Corvosa. We, we trapped him there. I, I wrestled his pet alligator. And we, we managed to, to get him and proof of his cooked books uh, into the guards of Corvosa. And if I'm being completely honest with you, the biggest crime in Corvosa is tax evasion. So 
<laughs> the, they managed to finally take him out once and for all. And that was um, how we met as a group. I now really want to see what it looks like when you're that an alligator. <laughs> well, it, it was even bigger than Ketu, and as I said, he was quite a large man. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty spry. When I had left the Shepherd's Ranch, I had escaped high into the mountains, into a monastery of dwarves. They taught me the importance of using my follow-through and my size to my advantage in a combat. So it, it never really matters that how big something is. I can still take it down. Then she picks up her shield and taps it with her mug. Yes, I imagine being small also works to your advantage because people expect less. And then you catch them by surprise. Oh, pretty much always. It's actually where I got my, my nickname, the Mini Mountain. We had been trying to see the King of the Ciders at Eel's End. He is a an underground casino-owning man. and uh, Well, in order to get to him, we had to prove that we were worth something to him. And so one of us had to challenge his biggest knivesies champion to a fight. And, well, I won. <laughs> uh, he was a big, big old half-orc, but I managed to trip him and pin his hand to the table. And, well, that, that made the King of Spiders laugh really hard. So he, he was always happy whenever Lil Lumby would come in and win a fight because people would see me and they would think, oh, a wrestling match with knives? There's no way this little halfling is going to win. So, they always bet against me and they always lose. I imagine you made them a fair amount of money with that. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> the, the pile of coins was hop taller than me. That's impressive. Tell me, how did you get involved with taking down the uh, queen? Well, you see, we had noticed that people around town had been getting sick with what eventually had come to be known as the Blood Plague. It was horrible. First, it started slow in the outskirts of town, you know, in the poorer sections. But after a while, it just kept moving through the entire city. Everything had to be completely shut. And, well, it, it turned out after months of investigation that the Queen had actually been behind it the entire time and that she was attempting to raise an ancient dead dragon that was beneath the city under the Shawanti Ziggurat. But we managed to stop her in time during the middle of her... Oh, I'm not good with magic. Her ritual. Yeah, but we stopped her just in time, thankfully. Otherwise, the entire city would have been destroyed once that thing raised up from the ground. Yes, that never ends well when, that, when rituals like that actually succeed. What was she hoping to gain from that? I believe he was trying to gain immortality, power. I, I think the spirits that were trying, that were playing with her and working her mind, had promised her great things. So there was something else that was influencing her. Oh, I truly believe that, and that's why I've never left Corvosa, because I have always expected that someday, whatever force was driving Queen Iliosa, would be back. So I've. Stayed with he, with the Church of Abadar since then, just trying to keep the streets clean. That's a good choice. I can respect that, and probably a smart one. Things like that don't tend to stay down for very long. No, not usually. <clears throat> you, you play whack a cult with the any of the cultists that pop up, and you know you get two down, one pops up. Sounds about right for pretty much everywhere. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I don't really stray very far from the place. I think after so many cults have been obliterated, they realize it's not going to work, but no, they keep trying. Well, you know what they say, the only difference between a cult and a religion is its size. <laughs> so, one person's cult is another person's, well, cathedral, I suppose. That's true. Just most religions aren't trying to bring about the end of the world. But they do tend to focus on different aspects of the end of the world. Well, we all tend to focus on our needs. Yeah, that's, that's true. So you said it's been a few years since you took down the queen. Have you then been on any crazy adventures since then? Since then, not so much. The craziest thing I've seen since the takedown of the queen was the Grand Bardic Virtuoso Games, where Tulip Wellington, who was a, a former member of the Gardeners, actually... 
he was kidnapped by a demon and we had to watch the participants of the games go and save him. It was the, m the wildest thing I've ever seen that I was not a part of actively. <laughs> I imagine that was very interesting indeed. It's not every day your friend gets kidnapped by a demon. Seeing your old friend disappear and being powerless to do anything about it is was quite tough. Did you go on any other adventures before you took down the queen? There was the time that, well, when I became a paladin, actually. I had never intended for it to happen. I was originally a follower of Gozre. As I said, I studied in a monastery for a short period of time. But there was an eclipse a couple years back, you may remember. And we had found out that there was a cult of Ratkin under Corvosa that was trying to blot out the sun permanently. That's a new one. Yeah, yeah. But we had gotten this information from Auditor Dorcas, who works, for, who is a member of the Church of Abadar. She's a paladin with them. Stout dwarf woman. She was taught me everything I know, honestly. But we were down in the sewers beneath Corvosa, and there was a rat king that was easily seven, eight feet tall. Uh, I, I once they get it past past about six feet tall, I can't really tell anymore. The sense of scale goes away, but. There was a giant rat king, seven, eight feet tall, that we had to face. But the ritual for blotting out the sun was this rat necromancer near the end of a cave. Dorcas was trying to jump across the chasm to get to, to him to stop the ritual, but with her heavy armor, she wasn't able to make the jump, was holding on to the edge by her, the tips of her fingers. So I, I had to jump across and help her, help her up, managed to get her back, but as soon as I jumped across the chasm to where the, the, the necromancer was, knocked them off the pedestal, I grabbed the, the, the little orb that they were holding, their ritual focus, and everything went black. The next thing I remember, I was waking up in the church of Corvosa. My friends had done a large ritual above my body, apparently, to bring me out of the magical coma I had been put in. When I woke up, my eyes were a different color. They have always used to be, you know, like a rusty bronze. But as you can see, looking at them now, they're gold with green flecks in them. At that point, I knew that the power of Abadar had been coursing through me. It was the power of not only my friends, but the Church of Abadar and the Paladins of Abadar who brought me back. And I had woken feeling stronger than before, with powers I never knew I had before. So ever since that day, I've walked the, the path of the Paladin of Abadar. That's quite the story. Not every day a god chooses to bring you back, especially if you're not already one of their own, but perhaps in the way you were. Well, I had tried to do good up to that point in my life, and we had been working with the members of the church, so perhaps I had done something to make him notice me. As you said, I, I was chosen. I did not choose the paladin life. The paladin life chose me. It's not often we truly get to choose our fate. It has a way of choosing us instead. Sometimes it seems that way. The wheel of fate turns and turns. And it has a very interesting sense of humor sometimes. <laughs> interesting being the key word. Yes. You mentioned your mother. How's she doing? Unfortunately, she is no longer with us. Um, Sorry to hear that. Well, thank you. Gadrian Lamb, the man who uh, owned the Shepherd's Ranch where she worked, well, he, he spent a lot of resources and time and money trying to find me again. He tortured her for information for how to find me. And after he got the information he needed, he just got rid of her. She was of no use to him anymore. Which is why it was so hard to put him in jail safely behind bars to live out the rest of his days, but... It was the correct thing to do, in the end, I think. Instead of taking his hand away, I felt. It was a lot of self-control on your part. Not many people would have. I mean, I probably would have killed him. There's <laughs> no telling what he's done to others. The things that man has done could fill books. How did you escape? Oh, well, my, <laughs> my mother had... A favorite client. His name was Jarek. He was a dwarf man. He was very kind. He was very trustworthy, too. She trusted him implicitly. And one night, under a full moon, I snuck out under his large overcoat 
I held on to his back and he put on the coat over me and we simply snuck out. And his brother was a member of that, the Dwarven Monastery in the Jenderhof Mountains. So under the cloak of night, he snuck me out of Corvosa and I spent the next five years with the Dwarves of Jenderhof. That's impressive. That's work. It was quite a quite a feat to get me out of the city. They, they always have guards. Travel in and out is always very closely monitored. At least it used to be back under the monarchy. But living up with the monks taught me many things, especially to use my size to my advantage. They also are the ones who taught me to fight with my shield. They always said that the best offense is a good defense. An enemy whose weapon is removed can be reasoned with. An enemy laid out on the ground can be coerced. An enemy killed has nothing to offer. That was uh, the lessons they always taught me. They didn't like violence. They preferred to end conflict quickly without death. I wish more of the people saw things that way. I think the world would be better. I think so too, but the fact that there are people who teach that, even if it's not everyone, but there are groups of people and notable figures such as yourself who believe that, I believe there's still hope. Mm -hmm. So when you were young, did you ever imagine you would be responsible for taking down the monarchy? Oh, I could have never even thought that. When I was young, I was just lucky to be to be able to not get beaten up by the other bastards at the Shepherd's Ranch. Um, they always thought it was funny when I would trip the tall boys, make them fall on their butts. But, you know, I still took my lumps. Back then, I never wandered far than about two blocks away from my bed. So the thought of becoming a knight, a paladin of Abadar, taking down a monarchy, the thoughts never would have crossed my mind, no. And yet here you are, living proof that you can be more than what the world says you should be. All you need to do is take that first step out. It's true. Hopefully it doesn't always have to be in the dead of night and hiding, but it's true. <laughs> Whatever gets you out the door. Cheers. Cheers. Aside from waiting to see what will happen, what do you think we'll do, you'll do now? Well, I'll continue my work with the Church of Abadar. Uh, I will probably spend the rest of my days here in Corvosa. We work very closely with the Shawanti tribes just outside the walls these days instead of against them. So I'll probably still attempt to continue the good work that Ketu always did back in the good days. But as long as Corvosa stands and the threat of whatever was controlling the queen is still out there, Lumbi Bronzearm will be here. Perhaps one day you will find that threat and be able to go and end it once and for all. And that would be quite the tale. And I wait for that day. Do you still keep in touch with your friends? Are they also waiting to see what happens? Ketu and Jofiel both passed away during the final fight. Laura Lissa, she went back to Magnamar. We still do send letters back and forth occasionally. I do know that Aiden Stillspeak is still here in Corvosa. He actually opened his own orphanage after all of the turmoil. So I, I do see him from time to time because uh, his orphanage works closely with the Church of Avatar. So I see Aiden most more than anyone these days. It's good that you've been able to keep in touch with them. For the most part, we try. You mentioned being in a monastery, but I wonder, why did you leave? Oh, well, I never actually became... A monk, as they were. It takes five years of study to even be given a shield like I have here. At that point, they begin their actual monk studies. I had just spent my time carrying buckets of water, chasing off birds that tried to steal our food, you know, things like that, painting the, the fences. But the night before I was supposed to actually begin my true training, I was in the courtyard practicing while the monks slept. Gadrin Lamb had sent his enforcers. He'd finally found me after torturing my mother. And I never heard the fires start. They were all dead before I even had noticed the flames. So when I found the body of Karm, that was Jarek's brother, he was my mentor at the, the monastery, I found his shield still attached to his body. It's actually the one I still use today here on my arm. When I saw that it was just ashes and bodies... I, I left left the mountain. 
I, I followed the road as closely as I could, but it took me three days to get down to the base of the mountain. Eventually, that was when I came across Jophiel, who I had mentioned earlier, the gnome lady. Uh, she was pulling her green cart. It was pulled by a goat. I'll never forget that goat, but she was the one who got me back to the city. Gave me food, a bedroll, and safety. But as I said, Gadron Lamb found us eventually because we had both crossed him in our pasts. And, well, the amount of running we had to do from Gadron because of our pasts was unreal. We ran for seven years before we finally were able to take him down. I can't even imagine how rough that must have been or how much of a relief it would have been when you finally took him down and didn't have to worry. It was a lifetime of running and worry lifted from many people's shoulders. He was a terrible person. How long did it take for you to be able to stop looking over your shoulder at everywhere you went? I still do. That's fair. It never hurts to be cautious. It's how I've stayed alive this long. Good habit to keep, but hopefully one of these days you'll be able to rest. Is he still in prison? Uh, last I checked, yes, he is still in prison. Tax evasion is a very serious offense in Corvosa. It's sometimes joked that it's looked upon worse than murder. As long as you pay your tax on the murder weapon, it's okay. <laughs> I wondered if that's less of a joke and more of people laughing at the horrifying reality. Yeah, that may be a little more accurate. You know, laugh because otherwise you cry. I think we have to do that far too often. In this crazy world, absolutely. But at least we're not alone in the insanity. In the end, no. I think we all just need to be there for each other. Whatever became of your friend, Jophiel? Well, she died during the final fight with Queen Iliosa. Jophiel was actually the one who came up with the cure for the blood plague. It came to her while she slept one day. She realized that the problem with the blood plague is it wasn't just a disease. It was also a curse. So we had to figure out how to lift a disease and a curse from an entire town all at once. And through a stroke of genius, she is the one who came up with the cure. But as we were fighting Queen Iliosa, she was attempting to heal me, actually. She wielded healing magics. But the Queen's guard had snuck up behind her and put a pike through her back. She fell protecting me, but it was enough that we were able to finally take the queen down. So she bought us enough time. She died a hero. Even so, I am sorry you lost your friend. It's never easy losing someone you cared about, especially someone you traveled with for so long. Yes, but I think she would have preferred it that way because she used her alchemies to save an entire town, possibly the world. You have a habit of finding good heroic friends. Well, I feel that was up to fate. Like I said, fate has a funny sense of humor, but there are many times where it requires a certain group to be able to save the world. Anyone else, everyone's going to die. The world will end up worse. Somebody has to do it. Yeah, so why not the people the world at least expects? It could be anyone next time. That's fair. When the world's in crisis, someone will always rise. It's true, it's part of why I travel so much to eat and get to know the people who may be brave enough to answer the call. It's important to tell the stories because otherwise you can't inspire people to take that call. Exactly, you never know the power of a story until it's been told. Another reason I travel as I do. And stories can be just as infectious as any plague. People can be killed, but a story never dies. It is very true. Here's to living good stories and may they ever be told. Here's to telling more each day. Cheers. Tales of Adventure is directed and produced by me, Brianna Toiber, as part of Pseudonym Social, a creative podcast network. The music is by Patrick Chester of Chester Studios. To see more of his work, visit his website at chesterstudios.net. Find out more about Pseudonym Social by visiting our website at pseudonymsocial.wordpress.com. 
If you like what I'm doing and would like to support this podcast, please go to patreon.com slash pseudonymsocial and choose one of the tiers connected to Tales of Adventure. You can also leave a review on iTunes to make our show easier to find for those who need it. Actually, uh, me and my friend here. It points to a cat. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, your friend's with a cat. Yes, he's he's one of those uh, Dreamlands cats. So uh, he's more than a cat. Yes, and he is very lucky to consider myself his friend. What did he say? He said that I was lucky to consider myself his friend. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I do feel that way. Okay. Uh, I don't have too many friends. You really aren't that bright, are you? No. <laughs> hey, it's me, Adam, the DM over at Microphones and Monsters. You just got done listening to a short clip from our show. Microphones and Monsters is a Cthulhu Mythos 5th edition actual play podcast. We ask you to join us every week, Monday and Friday. You can find us on your favorite podcatcher, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can find all of our links at microphonesandmonsters.com.